ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय All of life's goals and opulences are directly, self-sufficiently, increasingly, and unlimitedly increasing in you at every moment. Indeed, you are unlimited enjoyment in blissful existence itself. As far as we are concerned, O Lord, we are always after material enjoyment. You do not need all these sacrificial arrangements, but they are meant for us so that we may be benedicted by your Lordship. All these sacrifices are performed for our fruitive results, and they are not actually needed by you. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Being self-sufficient, the Supreme Lord does not need huge sacrifices. Food and activity for a more opulent life is for those who desire such material opulence for their interest. Yajyarata kamanon yatra lokumam karmabandhanaha if we do not act to satisfy the Supreme Lord, we engage in Maya's activities. We may construct a gorgeous temple and spend thousands of dollars, but such a temple is not required by the Lord. The Lord has millions of temples for his residents, and he does not need our attempts. He does not require opulent activity at all. Such engagement is meant for our benefit. If we engage our money in constructing a gorgeous temple, we are freed from the reactions of our endeavors. This is for our benefit. In addition, if we attempt to do something nice for the Supreme Lord, He is pleased with us and gives us His benediction. In conclusion, the gorgeous arrangements are not meant for the Lord's sake, but for our own. If we somehow or other receive blessings and benedictions from the Lord, our consciousness can be purified, and we can become eligible to return home, back to Godhead. We are reading from Canto 5 of Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter 3, entitled, Rishabdev's Appearance, text number 8. We find in this chapter, Maharaj Nabi, son of Agnita, grandson of the great King Priyabrat, has organized very qualified Brahmins to perform a great sacrifice. Maharaji, what do you The King Nabi understood it was his duty to God and to all the citizens to have a son who would perpetuate the rule of his dynasty. He was in a spirit of service. The king's duty, according to the Vedic principle, is he is to represent God by nourishing, supporting, and protecting all the citizens, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The great kings not only considered the requirements of their particular term of rule, but considered the welfare of humanity and all living beings for generations and generations to come. 
So it was his sacred duty to his forefathers and to God to have a son. But he did not want to do it in an ordinary way. Therefore he is performing a great, elaborate yajna, which was the Yuga Dharma at that time, for the purpose of receiving the Lord's mercy and blessings. Because nothing is truly auspicious without the, birth, without the blessings of the Lord and the great souls. And how do we get the blessings? By the performance of sacrifice. Sacrifice, Prabhupada quotes from Bhagavad Gita, Yadyaratat Kamanon Yatra Lokumam Karma Bandana. That whatever we do should be done as an offering of sacrifice for the pleasure of the Lord. Yatkaroshi Yadashtasi Yatstrahoshi Dadasi Yatapasya Sikonta Yatakurusha Madarapana. Whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever austerities or charity we may offer, it should all be done for the pleasure of the Lord. Some Sadir Hari If the Lord is pleased, then our life is successful. And that is really what sacrifice is about giving up one's own egoistic conceptions for the pleasure of the Lord, dedicating ourselves, our thoughts, our words, and our actions for the service of the Lord. That is the real meaning of sacrifice. Now the form in which this sacrifice takes place varies. We know in the age of Kali, Yajya, <coughs> The only religious sacrifice that is especially potent that can attract the supreme blessings of the Lord is the congregational chanting of the holy names. But the yagya, fire sacrifice, chanting of Vedic mantras, was recommended at this particular time. So the Brahmins performed this under the direction of the king. And they performed it so perfectly, with such devotion, that the Supreme Personality of God had personally appeared within the sacrificial arena. And Sukadeva Goswami explains how actually the Lord did not appear because they perfectly executed the sacrifice. He actually appeared because of the sincerity of the devotion of King Nabi and his assistants. Just as Srila Prabhupada, when he installed Krishna Balaram in Vrindavan, he had the local Brahmins performing days of yajyas, chanting the prescribed mantras, and like that. All the rituals were very nicely executed. But Prabhupada writes in a beautiful purport that the actual installation that attracted the deities, that attracted Krishna, Balaram, Radha, Shamsundar, Gornitai to appear within the deities was the devotees who were in the back of the temple doing Nam Sankirtan. Because they were chanting with sincere devotion, they attracted Krishna to come. So actually it is only the sincerity of our devotion, the genuineness of our intent to serve, that attracts Krishna. And the particular ritual is a form in which we express our intent to serve and to please the Lord. But when the Lord appeared, we find in these verses that the Brahmins who performed days of mantra and yajna and ritual, mantra, tantra, yantra, puja, mudra, they did all of that, expertly executed. But the Lord's mercy 
purify their hearts to such an extent that when they saw Lord Narayan, they were ashamed that we have approached you and performed all this yajna with a material desire. We find in the story of Dhruva Maharaj, he went to the forest with a material desire. He desired a kingdom greater than his father because he was wounded in heart by his stepmother. He was Dhrita Brata. He was very determined. Such determination, nothing and no one could divert his attention from the goal he pursued. It is a great example. It is that type of determination that we must all aspire to live by if we really want to achieve the goal. Dhruva Maharaj was willing to take all risks. Five-year-old boy alone. He was brought up in a palace under the care of his loving mother and father from the day of his birth. But he wandered alone into the forest. Tigers, snakes, poisonous insects, all sorts of physical austerities, heat, cold, wind, rain. But he didn't care. He was determined. Krishna tells in Gita, who is actually on the path of bhakti? Who is actually following the real principles of Bhagavad Gita? Not someone who sits home and says, work is worship. Not someone who just enjoys like anybody else in society and quotes a few verses every now and then, does a little puja and gives some donation. Krishna says those who are on this path, that means the path of the Gita, they are resolute in purpose. Their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branched such determination. Satatam kirtiyantamam yatanta sadhidatadrata. Krishna tells, who is my devotee? That devotee of mine is one who is always chanting my name and endeavoring with great determination. Endeavoring to live by the word of the Lord. Because in this world so many distractions will come from within and without. Therefore we must Understand very carefully and take the example of Dhruva Maharaj. I remember when that particular volume of Srimad Bhagavatam first came out. The place that I was living. That story, nobody heard it before. You see, in India, from childhood, you read in little comic books about Dhruva. Yes? Dhruva. Little Dhruva. And Narada Muni, Narayan, Narayan, like that. You see, you see it in plays. You, you hear it from your grandmothers telling stories. That's nice. But please understand, in the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world, nobody knew anything about Dhruva Maharaj. Until fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam was released. And then devotees were reading but the first we heard of Dhruva Maharaj was directly from the mouth of Sukadeva Goswami from Srimad Bhagavatam with Srila Prabhupada in all the previous Acharya's commentaries. It had powerful effect. Unbelievable effect. I remember when that came out, it was, I don't remember the year, but I remember it was in the summertime. And devotees were taking so many strict vows of determined renunciation. One devotee just decided for the next four months, I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> the 
because you have to be determined. Prabhupada just emphasized so much this determination of Dhruva and how it's so required to really make spiritual advancement. One time they asked Prabhupada, what if we are not, what if we don't have this determination? Prabhupada gave a very honest, open answer. Then you are animal. Hare Krishna. The difference between a human being and an animal is determination. Determination to discriminate what is right and what is wrong and do it. Not to just theoretically know it. But we have to do it. So there was one very senior devotee in the community I was living who actually decided not to sleep for four months. Chaturmasya. He actually did it. That means he wouldn't just lay down to go to sleep. He stayed up all night in the temple room and just walked around and chanted Japa. And every now and then, when it was just too much, he would just kind of lay on the floor of the temple room for a few minutes, then get up and chant. He did that for four months. And other people, they read the story about Dhruva Maharaj. I'm not doing anything. I'm a total sense enjoyer. I'm nothing. I'm so wishy-washy and lukewarm. What is Dhruva Maharaj doing? Nothing could dissuade him. The devotees were taking vows not to eat sweets, to eat one meal a day. The devotees were just determined to chant their crowns in such a way. The Deter- devotees were doing extra service. The devotees were giving up so much. Eating, sleeping, mating and defending didn't really exist in those days. It was like, it was like a craze for austerities with determination. That is how Prabhupada's purports affected us. So look at Dhruva. He goes to the forest. He's risking his life without protection. And he wasn't trained to do these things. It was completely foreign to his nature. He could have said, well, I lived in a palace all my life. How am I going to do this? Yes. My conditioning not possible. There was nothing that could stand between him and seeing God. His mother said, go to the forest, you'll see God. I will see God. Even Narada Muni offered him so many alternatives gave them all logical, philosophical, and social excuses to go back home after being in the forest for many days. Prabhupada explained when Narada Muni told him to go home and just, you know, be be an ordinary devotee. Sometimes our relatives tell us like this, just be normal. (laughs) You know, you could once a month or so go to the temple be with the devotees give a donation and then other than that just do what everybody else is doing why are you so strange so weird what are these people doing to you you're brainwashed yes just do a little puja take care of the house work as worship it's good enough on Janmashtami you can go to the temple no problem just be like everyone else so Narada Muni spoke this type of a alternative to Dhruva. You don't have to do this. Just to pass it in the jungle to the age of five. You go home and just be a nice devotee. Dhruva said, your words do not sit in my heart. Even though they may be on a certain level correct, they do not sit in my heart. And Prabhupada, in one lecture, he told me, he says that Dhruva Maharaj told Narada Muni that if you're not going to teach me how to see Krishna, please leave me alone. So he was tested. And when he passed the test, Narada Muni, then he gave him the truth and told him how to worship the deity, how to chant the names of the Lord, how to constantly immerse oneself in remembering the Lord. And Dhruva did it such determination for a month he was just eating fallen leaves 
was just drinking a little water, and then he was only breathing. He was only taking a breath. But his mind was completely fixed and focused in Krishna. Can you imagine? Such determination. And then the Lord appeared before him. First the Lord appeared within his heart and then appeared right before his eyes. And Dhruva Maharaj, according to Hari Bhakti Sudhogaya, he offered that beautiful prayer that I was looking for broken glass, but I have achieved the rare diamond of your darshan. Dhruva was ashamed. He had some material motivation. But by his tapasya and by the darshan of the Lord, he realized how foolish any material benediction is. Vishayavani vartante nirahara siddhena dasavara jamra sopyasya padam dhrishva nivartate It's very, very difficult to give up the lower pleasures of this world. But if we experience the higher taste, then we can permanently be transcendental to the modes of nature. This material energy of mine, Krishna says, this divine energy of mine, consisting of the three modes of material nature, very difficult to overcome. But one who surrenders to me can easily cross beyond it. Because when we surrender to Krishna, when we surrender to Krishna, Krishna reveals himself to us. And the Brahmins here are explaining how Krishna, he is the source of all opulences. All strength, all knowledge, all wealth, all beauty, all fame, all renunciation. All these six opulences in full Krishna possesses eternally. Krishna tells in Gita, all the charming, wonderful things of this world that attracts our mind are all but a spark of my splendor. Whatever we're attracted to, it only has an attractive quality in this world because it is a perverted reflection of Krishna's energy. If the, if the energy of the Lord intoxicates, infatuates people's minds to such an extent that. People become mad to enjoy Krishna's energy. Just insignificant manifestations of that energy. Then what is the beauty, what is the glory of the Shakti Man? The source of everything that exists, Arava Karana Karana. Krishna is all attracted. The Brahmins here explain that all of life's goals and opulences are directly self-sufficiency, unceasingly and unlimitedly increasing in you at every moment. Krishna has all opulences in full, and they are unceasingly increasing at every moment. And therefore the love of a devotee who surrenders to Krishna, that love, is increasing at every moment. It is not stagnant and never will be so. So when Dhruva Maharaj saw the extraordinary beauty of Lord Narayan, Premanjana Shurita Bhakti Vilochanena, because by the mercy of his Guru Maharaj his eyes were anointed with the with the cosmetic of love. Therefore, he could see Krishna as he is. And then, the kingdoms of this world had absolutely no charm, no attraction for him. Srila Prabhupada quotes Yamunacharya of Sri Rangam. Now, at one time, he was a king, and he was very attached to material enjoyment, especially sex life. It is Maituna Agar. It is the most powerful knot that keeps us tied.
tied to material bondage. He was so attracted to this type of enjoyment. But he writes, Since I have tasted the sweetness of serving you, my Lord, when I even think of such thoughts, I, my lips curl in distaste and I spit at the thought. That is the power of Krishna. We can understand, in truth, one who's actually experiencing God by how genuinely and consistently that person is detached from selfish, egoistic desires. This is the test. Speaking nice slokas and speaking nice philosophy is our duty to repeat the words of God. And that gives an indication. But one must live by the principles. Srila Prabhupada explained to us, a realized soul is not one who could perform mystic powers. Why? Even demons, who have no control at all over their senses, can perform mystic powers at times. It isn't simply someone who is very learned or very charismatic. Actual symptom of one who is self-realized, who is experiencing God, is they are detached from material enjoyment. They are experiencing a higher taste, consistently consistently detached. And the supreme form of detachment is one's body, mind, words, life, one's every moment is being utilized with great enthusiasm in the service of the Lord. Simply detachment in neutrality is not a sign of love. It may be a sign of liberation to some extent, but detachment in the mode of love is when all of our senses, all of our mind is used for the service of the Lord without consideration of prestige, honor, or gross enjoyment. These Brahmins, they are seeing God directly and they're feeling some shame as our very exalted Shamananda Prabhu was explaining yesterday in his nice class. They were, he, they were feeling ashamed. We were approaching you with some material motive. But you are so merciful, so kind that you have appeared before us. And obviously now, they only wanted loving service to the Lord. In today's verse, the Brahmins are extolling the glories of the Lord that the Lord is self-sufficient. He's the proprietor of everything that exists. He does not need anything. The purpose of the sacrifice is not for you. It's actually for us. We need your benediction. That's why we're performing the yajna. They're offering oblations of ghee. Does Krishna need our ghee? Hare Krishna. Brahma Samhita explains that in Vrindavan there are unlimited surabhi cows. Yes? Can you imagine the taste and the fragrance of the ghee of the surabhi cows of Goloka? It's extraordinary nectar. What is Vrindavan? Swarup Damodar explained the opulence of Vrindavan with a very dust is more valuable than all the most precious jewels within the universe. It is, and the Chintamani stone is decorating the feet of the maidservants of Brajbhumi. And every tree is a kalpabriksha, a desire-fulfilling tree, where anything you desire, the tree will provide for you. And where there are unlimited surabi cows, each one can fulfill every intimate desire of the heart. They give profound milk. And the Brijabhasis, they don't want anything but the fruits from those desire trees. They do not want anything except the milk of the Saravi cows. They have no other desires for all of eternity. 
and such Surabi cows are traveling, roaming from pasture to pasture to pasture, and there's unlimited, giving unlimited quantities of milk. Vrindavan is a place where all walking is dancing, all speaking is singing, all water is nectar, and Krishna's constant companion is his flute, and that flute the essence of all nectar is forever penetrating, enlivening the heart with ecstatic love. So Rupta Goswami said, these are a few of the opulences of Vrindavan. Hundreds and millions of trillions of times more opulent than Vaikuntha or Dwarka because of the sweetness of love. That is real opulence. When Krishna reveals himself to us in reciprocation to love, then we can understand what is of real value. Krishna does not need anything. The Brahmins are chanting mantras, but Krishna is the ultimate author of all the mantras. Krishna says, I am the compiler of the Vedas. I am the knower of the Vedas, and all the Vedas are I to be known. So does he need us to chant mantras? No. Does he need our ghee? No. He is everything. But we need to do it. Srila Prabhupada is explaining of the building of temples. When Srila Prabhupada was at Juhu Beach, there was a very great uh, challenge. It was like a, it was like a battle. You see, he wanted to put the deities there, and he very honestly, in an honorable way, made a payment for the land. And the man wanted to cheat him. And Prabhupada understood that he's representing Krishna. This is all Krishna's money, made by the hard, the hard work of the Sankirtan devotees. Yes? No, he wanted to protect. So he installed Sri Sri Radharas Bihari in a simple little shack. Such a shack. Simpler than anyone in our congregation. So simple. It wasn't a flat. It was a shack. Yes? Taupa was living there. And Radharas Bihari was living there. How wonderful. Here is the Supreme Lord of the Goddess of Fortune, Lakshmi Nath, comes to, to the wealthy city of Bombay, and you have Malabar Hill and so many wealthy people with wealthy areas, with big houses, all these mansions built by the British. Yes? comes to Bombay, Radharani and Krishna. Radharani is herself the source of Lakshmi Devi. And they're living in a simple shack that doesn't cost more than a few rupees to make. In a jungle. Uh, no gardens, just in a jungle. And Prabhupada was living there with him, with his devotees. Very difficult. Giriraj Swami Maharaj is writing a book about this. And people will be astounded to hear how Krishna resided. So yes, here is the source of all wealth, along with the goddess of fortune, living in the wealthy city of Bombay, in the simplest, poorest conditions. The Prabhupada wanted to build them a beautiful palace, a wonderful marble temple. As Prabhupada explains here, a gorgeous temple. But was he doing it for Krishna? In Dwarka, Krishna had 16,108 palaces. Each one was more beautiful than Indra's in heaven. 
Now there is no possibility of anybody building anything that can compete with Indra's palace in heaven. Hare Krishna. But here he was living in a little shack and Prabhupada was fighting, fighting so hard for years together to build that temple. He was going against all odds. His legal advisors, his leading disciples, everyone thought, just forget it. It's not possible. It's an over-endeavor. Just forget it. We cannot do it. This man had all political power, all wealth. He had everything. Prabhupada had nothing. And his disciples had less. Prabhupada was determined, we're going to build this temple. When they started, the municipality came and tore it down. <laughs> Prabhupada was persistent to do it again. Hare Krishna. Why? Does Krishna need it? Prabhupada did it for the world. He did it for all of you. To build such a wonderful temple that Krishna could reveal himself in such a way that countless people will come to receive his mercy and their lives will be transformed. That is what it is all about. Transformation of the heart. The Prabhupada did it for that purpose. So yes, Prabhupada is explaining here that Krishna doesn't need anything. And when we understand that, we'll be humble. We cannot be proud. When we think that we're doing something substantial and wonderful for Krishna, then we'll become proud. I have given a lot of money. I have managed very expertly. I have preached and brought so many people. Pride is an insidious weapon of Maya. Insidious. It's also like when, when pride enters the heart, it's like an earthquake under the sea of our consciousness. And at the beginning, it seems like everything's going very well. It may even go on like that for years. You see all the results I'm getting. You see how happy I am. You see how stable everything is. But understand the tidal wave of the reaction is in motion. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't taste it until it crashes upon the shore of our life. And then devastation. In the Christian Bible, St. Paul spoke, Pride cometh before the fall. What does a fall mean? For so many years we're investing to try to build some spiritual quality, spiritual characteristics, spiritual virtues, spiritual knowledge, spiritual realizations, and we may become actually you know, effulgent and empowered. It's like building our spiritual kingdom within our heart. But that wave can devastate everything and draw it all back into the ocean of material existence. So how to guard ourselves against this fall, this pride? We see in the prayers and in the attitude of all the great souls to our holy scriptures, there's one thing, they're never ever proud. How humble was Prahlad? I'm just a materialistic demon. I know nothing. It's the way he was feeling. How humble was Ambarish Maharaj? Even Durvas Muni, who committed such a, a horrible offense, he, he attempted to murder Ambarish. But Ambarish Maharaj didn't feel any resentment. He didn't feel any negativity. But Krishna, my body belongs to you. You're the ultimate controller. If you want me to die, take me. I'm yours. 
that's humility. Vasudev the leper became what became worried. You have cured me by your leprosy. You have given me a very beautiful, effulgent body. What if I become proud? Everything is spoiled. So how? How could we resist this very subtle, insidious, powerful weapon of maya? Like a disease. It enters our heart and in due course of time the wave of the reaction just builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and when we're least expecting it, crash, we're devastated. We have seen very, very empowered personalities who are manifesting such incredible spiritual excellences just crushed by the reaction of the tidal wave of their own pride. And everything's finished. They can't remember anything anymore. Krishna tells us in Bhagavad Gita, that he is the source of remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. You cannot remember Krishna without his grace. And you can't forget Krishna without his grace. <laughs> you can't know Krishna without his grace. So what do we have to be proud of? He's the source of everything. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's devotees, Rupa and Sanatan, Thakur Haridas, all of them, they display this quality of humility with such genuine feeling. So Krishna, he does not need anything we do for him. Srila Prabhupada explains that really even the greatest possible service we can do for Krishna, what it's all about is taking a handful of water from Ganga Devi and offering it to Ganga Devi. We take the water, O oh Ganga Mai, please accept this offering. Does she need it? We're taking it right from her, insignificant quantity, and we're offering it. Krishna does not need anything. He is self-sufficient in every way. But the most beautiful and wonderful quality of the Lord is the Bhaktivasa. That means he takes such great pleasure in receiving the loving sentiments of his devotees that he, he becomes subordinate, overpowered, and conquered by the love of his devotee, if it is genuine, by his own sweet will. So yes, when we're chanting the holy names, which is the sacrifice recommended in this age of Kali, Krishna doesn't need our chanting. Krishna doesn't need our offenseless chanting. Krishna doesn't need our pure chanting. He doesn't need anything. He's eternally beside Srimati Radharani. What is our love in comparison? Srimati Radharani is the source of all love, all devotion, all everything. Who are we? We're insignificant, infinitesimal, little tiny jivatmas who have rebelled enviously against Krishna since time immemorial and is engaged in egoistic, sinful activities. Does Krishna need our love? But he's so kind. He's so merciful. That even when an insignificant jiva chants the holy name, we're not, we're not chanting because Krishna needs. We're chanting because Krishna loves us. Krishna wants us to be happy. Krishna wants to, us to experience the unlimited oceanic nectar of his love. From a positive side, when we, sur when we surrender to Krishna, we may not get the result. Surrendering to Krishna is like another type of earthquake. In in the bottom of the ocean of our consciousness. 
And it may seem for years and years and years that, ah, I just have nothing, no love, nothing, I'm just struggling and striving. But it's just a matter of time. You may not see it immediately. But then when that tidal wave hits the shore, it washes away all of our materialistic, egoistic desires, cleans our heart completely, and then we can see Krishna directly. His mercy, Krishna's mercy is more powerful than all, the most powerful of all tidal waves. So yes, Krishna, he wants us to be happy. His love is our only his love is our only qualification. His causeless love. He descends into this world again and again and again to give, to give kindness to those who have offended him unlimited times. Who is willing to do that? Only Krishna and his purest devotees. We chant the holy name because it pleases Krishna. And really, what is it that pleases Krishna? Krishna is pleased by our sincerity. And why is he pleased by our sincerity? Because by our sincerity, we will be able to access his complete mercy. And then we could become happy, eternally happy. Anandam buddhivaradaram pratipatam punam ratasvatanam. Krishna wants to taste our love, why? Selflessly, so that he can give us the ecstasy that is born of loving him. He can give us himself. That is what bhakti is about. The principle of love means selfless. Krishna's love is selfless. Krishna's causeless mercy is simply for us. And a devotee's love is selfless. It's only for Krishna. The Braj Gopis, they left everything for Krishna on the night of Sarat Purnima. Everything. Even greater determination than Dhruva Maharaj. They went into the forest. Many dangers. Ridicule. Rejection. Criticism. So many things were upon them, but they didn't care. Krishna's calling them. Krishna's flute stole their hearts. And when they came before Krishna, even Krishna rejected them. He sent them home. But their determination, and their determination was not anything for themselves. They had no sensual or egoistic aspirations. They were there only for Krishna's pleasure. It was the all in all. Sri the Prabhupada explains from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita that gopis never, ever, ever even have the slightest trace of personal consideration of their own welfare or their own happiness. Exclusively, they are dedicated to Krishna's happiness. And they're willing to do anything, everything, for Krishna's happiness. Selfless love. And Krishna tells gopis, even in an entire lifetime of Brahma, I have no power to repay you, even with all that I possess in all material and spiritual worlds. Therefore, Krishna gave the gopis himself. That is love. So Krishna does not need anything from us. He just wants the genuine, pure, expression of love and surrender. That is all. And why does he want it? For our sake. That's all. Because he wants us to be ananda, happy. All of life's goals and opulences are directly, self-sufficiently, unceasingly, and unlimitedly increasing in you at every moment. Indeed, you are unlimited enjoyment and blissful existence itself. As far as we are concerned, O oh Lord, we are always after material enjoyment. You do not need all these sacrificial arrangements, but they are meant for us so that we may be benedicted by your Lordship. All these sacrifices are performed for our fruit of results, 
and they are not actually needed by you. Mahaprabhu Bhakta Ganer Vaidagya Pradhan. Kapiraj Goswami describes that Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the devotees of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, their very life and soul is renunciation. And Lord Chaitanya is exceedingly pleased to taste the sweetness of the renunciation of his devotees. And what is that renunciation? Whatever we do is for Krishna. We can build beautiful, beautiful temples for Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is pleased. There's nothing that pleases Krishna more, according to Gita, than preaching his glories and the facilities that help to preach his glories. So the essence of renunciation is without ego or desire for personal aggrandizement or pleasures to chant the holy names, to serve the Vaishnavas, and to perform austerities for the sake of uplifting other people's consciousness. That is true renunciation. That renunciation sustains the devotees of the Lord and it is most pleasing by Krishna. Would you like to speak something, Maharaj? Can we transport microphone to His Holiness, Niranjan Swami Maharaj? I'm, I'm deciding if I should speak something or ask a question. <laughs> you should speak something. <laughs> well, you said a lot. And uh, it's difficult to add always upon something that you've presented because you cover everything. I was thinking though, when you were describing how the Lord does not eat anything, uh, He's fully self-satisfied, self-sufficient. I think also the verse describes that, that uh, uh, the Lord is self-sufficient and therefore does not require anything. And therefore, when we offer something to the Lord, ultimately it is for our own benefit. The Lord is simply pleased when it's offered with love. And the nature of loving relationship is described by Sri Rupa Goswami. He says that if there are certain characteristics of love, there is the Srup Lakshana, or the primary characteristic of love, which is that it's Krishna Anushilana that it is meant for Krishna's pleasure. And then the Tathasta Lakshana, which is the secondary characteristic of love, is that it's Anyabhalashi Tushanyam, which means there is no agenda. The person who makes the offering for the Lord's pleasure does it exclusively for the pleasure of the Lord, and he's never thinking or never expecting anything in return. Therefore, sometimes when we hear that when we offer something for the pleasure of the Lord, we benefit. And therefore, we can get caught in a particular type of dilemma, thinking that I have a predisposition towards this offering because I've already heard so many times that when I offer something for, to the Lord for the Lord's pleasure, I will get some benefit. But of course, as we understand that that kind of predisposition that we may have is that is if we're thinking of getting something in return, then it's not love. <laughs> if we're thinking of how we will benefit, then it is not actually a, a full expression of love because the primary characteristic is that it's exclusively for Krishna's pleasure. And therefore, Srila Rupa Goswami has very nicely in this verse, Anyabhalash Tashanyam Jnana Kamanyanavatam Anupulyena Krishna Anushilam Bhakti Uttama 
has given the most complete understanding of, of an offering of love is that the primary characteristic is uh, the Sarup Lakshana is that it must exclusively be meant only for Krishna's pleasure even if it brings us displeasure without any expectation of return so when it's offered in this way then is the example this is given by I think it's Balad Maharaj in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavatam that uh, when one offers something to the Supreme Lord with love he gives the example that it's like decorating one's face in the mirror he says that when one decorates his face in the mirror then he doesn't have to make a separate effort to decorate the reflection the reflection is automatically decorated so in the same way when we offer something to Krishna with love then automatically we will benefit uh, so of course that primary characteristic means is that we always have to think exclusively of the Lord's pleasure and be willing to accept any inconvenience and we see so many examples that are there in the sh Shastra of devotees who voluntarily underwent great inconvenience just as you gave the example of the gopis love was the highest emblem of love because the gopis were prepared to accept so much personal inconvenience to please the Lord at the greatest expense of doing something which was consi considered to be a disgrace to leave in the middle of the night to leave their families to leave their children uh, to leave their domestic responsibilities and relationship to their families but their willingness to do that to accept all personal inconvenience exclusively for the pleasure of the Lord has brought them to the point of being recognized by Lord Chaitanya as the highest sacrifice for the Lord's pleasure and therefore we as Gaudiya Vaishnavas should always aspire in whatever service that we perform she should aspire for this example that we see in the gopis is that we should be willing to personally sacrifice our own comforts, our own happiness, our own personal needs and pleasures whatever is necessary and our primary goal of life is simply to obtain the most complete understanding is what is it that we can possibly do which will bring the Lord pleasure and you have nicely concluded your lecture by helping us to understand that, that the greatest sacrifice that we can possibly make for giving pleasure to the Lord is to spread to make sacrifice, sacrifices for the sake of others and to bring others to Krishna consciousness and to help others realize their eternal relationship with the Lord as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita he says that in this world there is no servant who is more dear to me than he nor will there ever be one more dear for one who explains the supreme secret of devotional service to the devotees uh, uh, one who is made devotional service to him is guaranteed and at the end he will come back to me so uh, we all have an offering of gratitude to you for helping us achieve this realization as we're sitting here and hearing your lecture thank you very much Hare Krishna we are grateful to you Maharaj thank you very much is there any questions? Uh, you are speaking about determination sometimes we see that when devotees are very determined and the fellow devotees may you know, see, see that as a fanatism and then he has to again decide oh am I being fanatical or and then sometimes if some devotee is too accommodating it can be perceived as being loose in his behavior so how do we balance these two things? that we are
సేమ్ టైమ్ డిటర్మైండ్ అండ్ నాట్ ఫనాటికల్ అండ్ అకామిడేటింగ్ బట్ అట్ ద సేమ్ టైమ్ నాట్ లూజ్ follow in the footsteps of great souls shri the prabhu pad manifested such a inconceivable power of determination it was probably easier for dhruva maharaj at the age of 5 to go into the jungle than prabhu pad to go to the asphalt jungle of new york city at the age of 70 Yes, and so many people warned him against going. Sumati Maharaji, she was kind of like Narada Muni, telling him, don't go, Swamiji, you're too old. <laughs> You'll die, just stay here in Juhu and preach to us, we'll be very happy. We'll provide everything for you. He was determined. And even after getting there and so many failures and death threats and ill health and his well-wishers and god-brothers in India were asking him, come back, it's impossible, just come back. It's determined. Nothing could divert him. The physical, emotional strain that he had to endure. Until you're 70 years old, you won't really be able to begin to truly appreciate what Prabhupada had to undergo for us. Very difficult. Incomprehensible. That was determination. And despite even what was that Dr. Mishra and Nikolananda Swami from Ramakrishna Mission, they were telling Swamiji, you should not wear these Indian sadhu clothes, you should wear western clothes, who will listen to you, and you can't, four regulative principles, you can't tell American people about these four regulative principles. <laughs> and these were people who were preaching in the West for many, many years and were very, very successful in their own way as far as recruiting followers. They were telling them, don't talk about these four regulative principles, and don't dress like this. Prabhupada was determined. From the very beginning, you first walk into 26th, second act. I mean, you, four regulative principles, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, no media. Prabhupada was not compromising in his own life especially. But yet at the same time, he was so completely accommodating to, to forgive to tolerate the difficulties, the shortcomings, the conditionings of those who came to him. And always giving them another chance, another chance, another chance to come forward. So in essence, we should accept what is favorable for devotion and service and reject what is unfavorable. We should be determined. We should be very determined. Our spiritual advancement will very much be according to our determination. But we have to understand what real determination in the path of bhakti is. It must be with humility. Fanaticism is, if our determination, if our doing great things or austere things, if it makes us proud, if it makes us think that we're better than somebody else, then we're going to fall down. We should be humble. We should not compare ourselves to others or think that I'm better than others. Krishna Das Kavidaj Goswami was living in the same spirit as Raghunath Das Goswami on the banks of Radha Kund. And yet he's not thinking he's better than anyone. He's thinking he's more lowly than a worm in stool. So that is important. Fanaticism is often based on false ego. Our determination inflates our false ego and the results we gain. So we should be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant like a tree, ready to offer all respect to others and expect none in return. We should be determined to be that. And we should do it honestly, not as a show bottle. We should actually really try to do it honestly for our purification.
with the pleasure of the Lord. But we must be determined. And if we're loose in the name of not being fanatical, that's just Maya giving us an excuse. And we should be strict. We should be determined. But we should, we should be with humility, respect to others, and then it's perfect. Would you like to add anything, Mara? Huh? So then that's good enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. <laughs>